Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. My name is Tony Shields, this is episode 39, and in this episode, we're going to be answering the question of whether or not there exists a mushroom that can satiate you for the rest of your life, bringing some common sense to a viral meme that is going around right now. We're also going to be looking at the curious case of a mushroom that is both a delicious gourmet edible, but can also be deadly poisonous. The weirdest part is that this mushroom is one of the most popular gourmet mushrooms in the world, so how could this be? And finally, we're going to be covering a quick update on the legal landscape for psilocybin mushrooms and cluster headaches. This is a topic we recently went deep on, but since then there have been a number of interesting developments. So if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, please do me a huge favor and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. So I recently saw this meme going around and it actually got so popular that Snopes, a popular fact-checking website, had to do a fact-checking article about it. I thought it was a good chance to talk about one of my favorite mushrooms to find in the wild and one of the coolest mushrooms of all time in my opinion and we'll get to exactly what species it is in the minute but first let's start with the theme of the meme. This idea that there is some kind of mushroom that if eaten only once is enough to feed a person until the end of their life. Of course this is just a fun play on words maybe on the first read or to the extremely gullible you might think that there's some fantastical mushroom that if you eat it only once it can satiate you for the rest of your life and you'll never be hungry again, which is obviously impossible unless, of course, you have a very truncated lifespan, which is kind of the morbid joke here, right? If you eat a deadly poisonous mushroom, well then, sure, it can satiate you for the rest of your life. The truth is there are some deadly poisonous mushrooms, but the really, really deadly ones, the really dangerous ones, are very few and far between. Of course, there are lots of mushrooms in the world, millions even, and the either really, really deadly or the really, really delicious sit at the very long tail of a spectrum. Most mushrooms in the world sit somewhere in the middle. They're not deadly poisonous, they're not really delicious, and they're not all that interesting to most people. But the funny thing to me about this meme is that the mushroom they show, although it looks super bright and unique and interesting, maybe looks like something that could unalive you, is not considered to be deadly poisonous at all. It's not even considered poisonous, it's just considered to be inedible. It's called Rhododus palmatus, and anytime this one gets posted on social media, it gets a ton of attention because it does look really cool. It is rare for the most part, and even considered to be endangered for the most part. Being added to so-called fungal red lists and considered to be threatened in 12 countries and illegal to pick in others. But where it does show up, it seems to be relatively common and seems to show up repeatedly. So I think this one, in my opinion, would be considered maybe regionally rare or regionally common, depending on where you're looking. There is a log near where I live that actually produces Rhododus palmatis every single year for at least five years now. Every single time I go out and check the log in the early summer, it is growing on the very same log in the very same knot, which is super cool. Now, here are a few of the reasons why I think Rhododus palmatis is so interesting and so unique. First of all, it just looks cool. It's also called the rosy vein cap or the wrinkled peach because it looks like kind of a wrinkled peach with these unique netted patterns on the cap of the mushroom. When it's pulled apart, it has a really weird texture. Unlike any other mushroom, it's really rubbery and kind of feels like a weird ear. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's kind of a unique texture. It will often exude or bleed or sweat or whatever you want to call it, but it will quite often have a red orange liquid that comes out of it as it's grown. You see this quite often, for example, in oyster mushroom grain spawn, where it will exude these kind of orange liquids that are called metabolites, and they can quite often have some very interesting properties. I know, for example, there has been some research that tries to force mushrooms to compete against a certain competitor, and then these metabolites that it will produce will have kind of an antidote to whatever it's trying to compete against and can have some really interesting implications for future medicine. Rhododus palmatis is also pretty neat in how it grows, starting out with these little pins and eventually growing out into the wrinkled peach shape. But when they get really old, they lose some of their color and also lose some of that netted formation on the cap. It really smooths out. They also quite often grow in clusters and will show up year after year if you go to the same spot. But perhaps most interestingly is that this mushroom is so unique that it happens to be the only mushroom in its genus. In fact, scientists couldn't quite fit this mushroom into any of the other genuses, so they had to invent a new one in order to make it fit. So in other words, the only Rhododus is in fact Rhododus palmatis, or the rosy vein cap. Yeah. How cool is that? So will this mushroom ever satiate you for the rest of your life? Well, no, but if you do find one, be sure to take a picture because it will probably get you a lot of likes on social media. On to our next story, one that you might think is a contradiction because I just talked about how mushrooms that are either deadly poisonous or gourmet edibles live on either end of a really broad spectrum. But there is one particular mushroom that is getting a lot of attention recently. In fact, it usually garners quite a fair amount of attention because it's one of the most popular gourmet edible mushrooms in the world. But it's also one that might span the entire 
entire spectrum of being a delicious gourmet edible or being deadly poisonous depending on how it's prepared. Now I should preface this by saying that most mushroom hunters or mushroom lovers already know this fact about this particular mushroom, but it does still kind of highlight how little we know about mushrooms in general. The mushroom I am talking about, believe it or not, is the morel. And no, not false morels, I'm talking about real true morels. And I know what you might be thinking, like what? The morel? Deadly poisonous? How could this be? I've seen it at restaurants. I've seen it in grocery stores. My local foraging club has people go out and search for this mushroom every single weekend in the spring. How could it be deadly. And I agree with you, at first glance it does seem kind of crazy, I've eaten plenty of morels myself and have never had a problem. And it's hard to understand exactly how this could be. And although scientists admittedly don't really understand exactly how this could be the case either, it's thought to be related to compounds in the mushroom that are altered by heat, such that the edibility of the mushroom is determined by how it is prepared. Again, this is something that is not really news to mushroom lovers. But last year, this strange property of morels hit the mainstream news after a massive outbreak from Montana caused a total of 51 cases cases of severe illness, including three hospitalizations and tragically two deaths. This is the report from the CDC titled Outbreak Linked to Morel Mushroom Exposure, Montana 2023, which outlines the investigation and the findings. The outbreak stems from a single restaurant that was serving morel mushrooms in a sushi roll that was prepared in different ways. Sometimes the mushrooms were covered in a hot marinade before being served, so you can think of those as being like partially cooked, but other times the mushrooms were prepared in a cold marinade before being served, so those were obviously uncooked, and that is what the CDC thought is most likely to be the source of this disaster. Because there was a strong correlation between people who ate this raw morel sushi and people who got severely ill. The symptoms usually started about 60 minutes after consumption and were also dose dependent, with the people who consumed more tending to get more ill. Now again, to be clear, most everyone who is into mushrooms, specifically morels, won't be surprised by this at all. It has been common knowledge for a long, long time that morels need to be cooked, but I guess it's still surprising that the effects were bad enough to be deadly because that is very unusual, and that was highlighted in the CDC report that stated, the two patients who died had chronic underlying medical conditions that might have affected their ability to tolerate the massive fluid loss. But the question still remains, what exactly is the cause for this? Is there some compound or something else in morels that is either killed or denatured through the heating process? Is it possible that the mushrooms could have been contaminated in other ways? Well, unfortunately, this question is still not fully answered. There was, of course, the possibility that this was just a case of misidentification, because morels are quite often wild harvested, so maybe the harvesters were out there in the woods picking morels and they accidentally threw a couple of death caps in there. But the truth is, morels are very easy to identify. You're not going to misidentify them for a death cap, so this is very unlikely. And these particular morels were actually a cultivated variety, which makes this possibility even more remote. These mushrooms that caused the illness were indeed true morels. This was shown through DNA sequencing, the exact species being Morchella sextolata for those interested. So what is really going on here? Well, the specimens were collected from the restaurant and tested for enteric pathogens, but they also tested for volatile organic compounds. These are compounds like formaldehyde and acetone, stuff found in morgues and nail polish remover. But why would they presume that there could be harmful volatile organic compounds in morel mushrooms? Well, believe it or not, morel mushrooms have long been hypothesized to contain small amounts of hydrazine, a highly toxic compound used in rocket propellant that can cause a variety of short-term and long-term health issues. Although there has never been any conclusive proof that true morels contain any hydrazine or even any compounds that might turn into hydrazine after they've been ingested. This is all just a hypothesis. But the fact that raw morels are poisonous and cooked morels are widely eaten does give some support to this idea. Hydrazine or not, there is little doubt that morels contain at least some amount of toxin that is not stable enough to survive the heating process. But it's just pretty amazing to me that we still don't know exactly what that is. And this recent outbreak certainly isn't the only time that raw morels have been implicated in large-scale poisonings. In 2019, a Michelin star restaurant served a morel dish that resulted in dozens falling ill and one person to tragically die, although the death was eventually reported to be due to a pre-existing condition. In 1991, there was a banquet in Vancouver that was serving raw morels as a salad topper and it ended up sickening over 77 people. Now, this might just be the largest large-scale 
mushroom poisoning in history, although happily no deaths were reported. But all of these events, again, were the result of raw or undercooked morels. Morels need to be cooked thoroughly. Even the CDC, in response to this latest outbreak, published some information on proper preparation methods for morels. But even so, hedging by saying properly preparing and cooking morel mushrooms can reduce the risk of illness, however, there's no guarantee or safety even if cooking steps are taken prior to consumption. In my opinion, and I'm sure this is shared by lots of other mycophiles, I think all mushrooms should be cooked. It just makes sense. Plus, they taste way better that way anyways. And although all of this might seem a little scary, like, wait, I'm supposed to eat something that's poisonous unless it's cooked? Like, no way. But we do this all the time. Like, for example, nobody eats raw chicken sushi, but if you cook the chicken, well, it's perfectly fine. It's not exactly the same, obviously, because with chicken, you're not worried about something that's inherently in the chicken. You're worried about some kind of contamination with uh, bacteria like salmonella, for example. But it's still super interesting to me that the exact culprit for why morels may or may not be poisonous is still unknown. And we keep coming back to this idea, right? This theme that mushrooms are mysterious. We haven't figured out all of their secrets yet. Which brings me to a somewhat related mushroom, the so-called false morel, also known as Gyrometra esculenta, that doesn't contain any hydrazine, but it does does contain gyrometrin, which inside of our bodies is hydrolyzed into monomethylhydrazine, which again is used as rocket propellant and is very poisonous and it can be deadly. But it seems like this risk can be removed by parboiling the mushrooms in a well-vented area, which seems like a lot of risk and a lot of work for a mushroom. But what makes this even more complicated is that the amount of gyrometrin, which again is this compound that can be hydrolyzed into monomethylhydrazine, can vary greatly depending on where the mushroom was harvested, and I'm sure it can also vary depending on what time of the year the mushroom was harvested or where exactly it was growing. But also there are a lot of closely related species that might look similar that might contain vastly different amounts of this gyrometrin. Which is why some sources will list this mushroom as deadly poisonous, whereas in other places in the world it's sold as an edible mushroom. And to put some context to this, a 30-year toxicology report from the North American Mycological Society published in 2006 lists dozens of reported poisonings from gyrometra species some of them quite serious, and although the most recent report covering 2018 to 2020 doesn't list any human poisonings, it still states that, though many people still eat Gyrometria esculenta, the large number of cases found in the past where there was liver and or kidney damage and many deaths in Europe hopefully may lead individuals to cease this practice, ending with, hopefully mushroomers are learning not to eat Gyrometria esculenta. And I agree, I haven't eaten this mushroom and never would, no matter how it was prepared. I love mushrooms, of course, but in my opinion, it's better to stick to ones that are really well known and really good for you and not known to cause any issues. So what are the lessons we can take away from this? Well, first of all, whether you love mushrooms or hate mushrooms, it's pretty hard to argue that mushrooms aren't incredibly interesting. There's still so much that we need to learn about them. And finally, it would be so cool to dedicate more resources to learning about mushrooms and studying mushrooms. Just imagine how much we could learn. This story really did make big headlines, but to people who are into mushrooms, it was not really new information, although hopefully still many people can learn from it. On to our next story story, which is a piece of mushroom news that I just wanted to share quickly because we just recently did a piece on cluster headaches. And then in the last two weeks, right in my home province, there has been some really interesting developments in this area. First off, at the end of May, there was this article published in the National Post titled, Calgary Man Could Get Assisted Death But Can't Get Access to Medical Magic Mushrooms. For some context, it was last year that Health Canada denied a Canadian man access to psilocybin mushrooms, citing that there was not enough evidence to support this specific use case, that being cluster headaches, while also saying that all other alternative therapies had not yet been tried. Right from the article, it reads that it's easier to get access to an assisted death in Canada than to a treatment that could make life bearable, according to a lawyer for a Calgary man fighting for legal access to a psychedelic drug to treat excruciating cluster headaches, which all seems a little bit hyperbolic until you read later in the article where it says Lance is in his early 50s and has been suffering from cluster headaches for seven years. A former land surveyor, he is unable to work, and he is on long-term disability. He's lost his house, he's been unable to socialize outside his home, and says that he contemplated suicide and medical assistance in dying, or made, for which he is potentially eligible. Continuing on here, it says, he doesn't want to die, said Lance's lawyer, Nicholas Pope. He's found a treatment that works for him and makes life bearable, but it's absurd. If he couldn't get access to the treatment, then made really would be a legitimate possibility. Now, in case you didn't see 
episode 37 of The Mushroom Show, just to catch you up, cluster headaches are an extremely painful type of headache, often cited as one of the most painful conditions that humans can experience. They can be chronic, happening repeatedly, and really affect people's ability to live a normal life. There's not a cure for cluster headaches, but one thing that has apparently worked for many for both prevention of cluster headaches and abatement of a cluster attack is psilocybin containing mushrooms. There is some science to back this up, and it is thought to be because of the chemical structure of psilocybin and how it can interact with serotonin pathways, and many people advocate for further research that could potentially lead to an effective treatment. But until that happens, the stark reality is that psilocybin mushrooms are still illegal in most places, and it can be very difficult for people who are suffering from this kind of thing to give it a shot. But just recently, Health Canada changed their decision, again citing an article from the National Post titled, Suicide Headache Patient Granted Magic Mushroom Access After Health Canada U-Turn. Jody Lance's historic win comes after a federal court judge ruled Health Canada wholly disregarded legal arguments that he has a charter right to medical grade psilocybin. The article continues, after a federal judge's scolding for its unreasonable and unintelligible handling of a Calgary man's bid for legal access to psilocybin for excruciating headaches, Health Canada is backing down. The federal health agency has granted cluster headache patient Jody Lance emergency access to psilocybin, a psychedelic compound found in magic mushrooms. It also points out the absurdity of the fact that in order to be eligible for MAID, you don't have to show that you've exhausted all other options, but for some reason, in order to be eligible for psilocybin, you do. Or at least you did. But in this situation, that has been reversed. And this really has me interested to see what kind of precedent this might set for future cases of either cluster headaches or other ailments where there might be some potential benefit from psilocybin. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please do go ahead and hit that like button. It really does help the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of the show, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. We'll catch you in the next episode.